Federico is one of my favorite people because he always laughs at my jokes, and that's a, that's a good way to get to my heart. Uh, what I want to talk about today is, uh, of course, the Trump tax cuts, but I want to put them in context because the political situation in the United States, as you can imagine, is unprecedented. Republicans and Democrats have always disliked each other, at least publicly. Privately, they might actually be friends, but they've always attacked each other. Uh, but with Trump in the White House, it's reached an entirely new level. Uh, the Democrats think that the 2016 election was theirs to lose, and they managed to lose it. Uh, and, and they've never forgiven Trump. And they actually, privately, they've never forgiven Hillary for losing what they thought was the, uh, was the unlosable race. Uh, but what makes it interesting is not only do they genuinely hate Trump, much more so than the, the normal dislike that you find between the political parties, but most Republicans don't like Trump either. Trump won as an outsider. He did not win with the Republican establishment. As a matter of fact, many members of the Republican establishment uh, view Trump the way you know, a vampire views daylight. You know, they, 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 they get terrified and they try to run away, uh, mostly because they think Donald Trump is going to cost them to lose the House and Senate uh, in 2000, in the elections this November, the midterm elections, as we call them. So it's a very unusual political environment we have in Washington where the Republicans control everything, but Trump and the Congressional Republicans are not friends. Uh, it, it's sort of like you're on the same soccer team with someone that you don't like and don't trust. You want to win the game, but you, know, you spend just as much time looking at your teammate who you don't trust as you spend looking at what's going on with the other team. So Washington is, is, is completely different than at any point I've seen it in my 30 plus years of operating in town. So with that as background, uh, let's go ahead and, and look at the, uh, my presentation. And I want to start with an observation by William F. Buckley. William F. Buckley was the founder of National Review, a famous conservative uh, magazine in the United States. And he said decades ago that he would rather be governed by random people from the Boston phone book rather than the faculty of Harvard University. And what he was basically saying is that he did not trust the wisdom and the judgment of these very smart people who were Harvard professors because they tended to be what Hayek called constructivists. They wanted to plan the economy. They thought that their brains somehow were superior to the decentralized wisdom of the marketplace. And of course, we now know that central planning is a crazy idea. But nonetheless, people at Harvard probably still to this day notwithstanding the collapse of the Soviet Empire, there are probably people at Harvard to this day who still think they should be planning the U.S. economy and controlling the U.S. society. Uh, and William F. Buckley did not trust those people, and he wanted random, or he preferred, random people from the Boston phone book. Well, that's the same choice the American people made in November 2016. They chose Donald Trump, who is I said this when I was in New Zealand last November uh, on a TV show. I said, Donald Trump is sort of the weird uncle, the crazy uncle who comes to your Christmas dinner. And he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have a lot of formal training in anything, but he has lots of strong opinions, and then he spouts off on those opinions. And it's sort of like, wait, you just said this, but you said this, and this, it was the opposite thing, and all of a sudden you have this opinion, and it doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter. If you're a so-called man on the street, you're not expected to have deep knowledge of policy. You have instincts. Uh, you have gut reactions. Uh, and that's what Donald Trump has, for better or worse. He, he is the man on the street, and he got elected because the American people, just like William F. Buckley, do not trust the credentialed, educated elites anymore. The credentialed, educated elites gave us the financial crisis, thanks to their easy money policy and the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac subsidies. The educated elites are the ones who keep giving us bigger, more intrusive government, because just like those Harvard faculty members, these credentialed elites, they think, oh, I'm smart, therefore I should be able to design and control society, and the American people fundamentally reject that notion, even if it means that they're, as we say in America, rolling the dice, taking a gamble, and voting for someone like Donald Trump. So what I want to do is talk about Trump's economic policy, given all this 
weird political environment we have in the United States. And I want to, of course, specifically focus in the latter part of my presentation on what he did on tax policy. But I'll start by saying that there are five major categories of economic policy, and they're all roughly equally important. If you look at the uh, Economic Freedom of the World Index, you'll, know, you'll see these five categories. You'll see the same five categories in the Index of Economic Freedom. You'll see these same variables in the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Report. It's really no mystery what drives growth. Uh, it's driven by fiscal policy, regulatory policy, monetary policy, trade policy, and rule of law and property rights. Uh, you know, and, and so you think about why is it a place like Hong Kong or Singapore, why do those places grow so fast? Why do places like uh, France and Italy and Greece grow so slowly? Uh, why are many developing world nations economic, uh, as Trump said, chip holes? Uh, it's because they have bad policy. Uh, it's not because the people there are bad, but when you have horrible, corrupt governments uh, where the politicians see their role as stealing resources from the people, of course you're going to have very bad economic results. And all these things are measured in, in documents like economic freedom of the world uh, that measure countries on the basis of the amount of economic liberty they have, or in many cases they don't have. So what does Trump think? What is Trump doing on these five economic policy areas? Well, on two of them, we have no idea. And Trump probably has no idea. Uh, because, again, yeah, he's a man off the street. Now, again, yeah, I'm not saying this to denigrate the average person off the street. The average person on the street is more concerned about, you know, their family and their job and, and, and you know, just ordinary things that normal people care about. It just so happens that we have a man on the street in the White House. So what does Trump think about monetary policy? No idea. Some people speculate because he's a real estate developer, he might like artificially low interest rates. So I put on here that the best guess is he's probably comfortable with the status quo, which by the way worries me a little bit because I think there's uh, central banks around the world have created an, another bubble in financial markets. What does Trump think about the rule of law and property rights? Well, he probably strongly believes in property rights for his property. Does he believe in property rights for other people's property? I don't know. You know, for lack of for lack of any specific knowledge, I assume he's probably no better or no worse than Obama. Uh, you know, and what that means, you know, who have been knows. Let's look at the issue area where Trump is clearly bad. He's a protectionist. He genuinely seems to think that voluntary exchange, mutually beneficial voluntary exchange across borders. He thinks somehow that's akin to some sort of a war or something like that. There has to be a winner and a loser. That's nonsense. By definition, trade among, by the way, trade is not between nations. Trade is between people and companies in nations. But trade is voluntary and it obviously only occurs because both parties think they're being made better off. Uh, but unfortunately, politicians measure something called the trade deficit, and the trade deficit sounds bad, even though it's not. I have a trade deficit every year with my local grocery store. <laughs> I'm always going to them and I'm buying you know, food, you know, eggs and milk and meat and things like that, and never once has my grocery store bought something from me. <laughs> so I have a giant trade deficit with my grocery store. Is that bad? No, of course not. It's voluntary exchange and both parties are being made better off and of course then the grocery store uses the money to buy supplies and maybe somehow you know as you circulate around the economy sooner or later some of that money comes back to me maybe one of the owners of the grocery store gives money to free market think tanks and somehow you know I've gotten some of it I don't know but the point is I'm only spending money on the grocery store because I'm better off Americans are only buying, say, Japanese cars because that makes them better off. And the fact that Japanese uh, people then choose to use their dollars that they earn to invest in the U.S. economy is actually a sign of strength in America. It's not a sign of weakness. Uh, Donald Trump does not understand that the opposite, the necessary 100% flip side, the other side of the coin, if you will, the necessary flip side of having a trade deficit is that you have a capital surplus. Foreigners like investing in America because we're seen as a good bet. 
we're still growing somewhat, especially compared to many other countries. So to me, the fact that we have a trade deficit is really just a sign that we have a big capital surplus, which is a vote of a, it's an endorsement by investors around the world in the U.S. economy. But because Trump has this, this mistaken, cramped view of what the trade deficit is, he has lots of very bad protectionist rhetoric. Now, the good news, so to speak, is that at least for 2017, he didn't impose a lot of protectionist policies. We were lucky. We all sort of like breathed a sigh of relief. Okay, if, if all Donald Trump wants to do is you know, talk about how unfair it is that other countries uh, are selling more to, uh, uh, to America than, than vice versa, fine, you know, that's empty rhetoric. Uh, and, and we think, okay, in the grand scheme of things, we're lucky if that's all he does. However, some of you have probably seen just in the last couple of days uh, that he imposed tariffs on uh, solar panels, he imposed tariffs on washing machines, and the real thing that many of us are worried about, because those are sort of just you know, individual market distortions, it's bad policy, on net Trump is going to destroy jobs, but he doesn't understand how trade works, getting him to understand that will, will probably be impossible. The real threat that we see out of Trump, and we don't know whether it's going to happen, is whether he A, pulls the U.S. out of NAFTA, and B, whether he tries to destabilize the entire WTO system. Uh, and, and now, the horrible scenario is we go back to the kind of tit-for-tat protectionism that we saw in the 1930s, and we all know that was a horrible decade. I don't think, even in my worst dreams, I don't think that'll happen because I don't think other countries will make the same mistake that Trump is making. So Trump could wind up trying to build an economic wall around America that will hurt the American economy, it will destroy on net jobs in America, it will lower living standards in America, but I suspect most other countries will continue to trade uh, with each other uh, within the framework of the WTO. Uh, so Trump is bad and we're just keeping our fingers crossed in America that he doesn't actually translate his bad policy and his bad ideas into really bad policy, we're hoping he just limits himself to mildly bad policy. Sometimes with governments, that's the best you can hope for. <laughs> now let's look at an issue where Trump is clearly good. Regulation. Trump does not like red tape. Now does he understand it from a deeply philosophical, economic-oriented perspective, or does he understand it just that he was in the business world and didn't like having to deal with red tape and regulation uh, from like you know, planning commissions and, and zoning commissions and things like that? I don't know. All I know is that his appointees, because of course when you're president of the United States, uh, you get to appoint several thousand people to staff the different executive branch agencies. And Trump has, by and large, appointed very good market-oriented people, some of them very libertarian-oriented, uh, to important positions in the regulatory agencies. And we've seen, just in terms of what's happened in the first year of the Trump administration, the volume of new regulations has declined. That's one important thing. But equally important, deregulatory initiatives have outnumbered regulatory initiatives. And I'm quite optimistic about the future. This is a chart showing pages of the Federal Register. And you can sort of see that presidents always, you know, you know, there's a slight increase over time in the number of pages in the Federal Register, which is an imperfect but still interesting sign of, of the regulatory activity of the central government. Well, Trump's first year is way on the end, and you can see it's much lower uh, than we've seen from other presidents. And not only that, but keep in mind, that even if you're doing a, a deregulation, if you're trying to unregulate something, you still have to issue that in the Federal Register. And so the, the fact that Trump has that many pages, well, most of those pages, according to the experts who follow regulation, most of those pages are actually deregulatory initiatives. So on regulation, uh, everyone's saying, wow, this is great. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of you know, taking some of the red tape that's sort of weighing down the economy and removing it. We're sort of opening up markets and just letting market forces dictate resources, not government controls and backdoor industrial policy. So for, for the people in the American think tanks, at least the free market ones who work on regulation, it's like Christmas. Much, much better than, uh, than uh, George W. Bush. Uh, 
probably as good as Ronald Reagan. I mean, you know, Trump has been very, very good on regulation. Now let's look at the issue that I care about the most, which is fiscal policy. <clears throat> and this one is hard to grade because Trump has been both bad and good. He's been good on taxes, and I'll, obviously I'll spend the rest of my presentation talking about that, but he hasn't been good on spending. And Federico gave that quote from Peter Schiff, which is, of course, the same sentiments that Milton Friedman often expressed. The real tax burden is how much government spends. Because how much government spends represents how much of the private sector's output is being diverted to political purposes rather than economic purposes. Now, the fact that some of it is financed by borrowing instead of taxes, the total amount of government spending is still a tax on the productive sector of the economy. Uh, so, I'm happy Trump is cutting taxes. I think the U.S. economy will benefit. But, if there's no serious effort made to control the burden of government spending, do I think that tax policy can be good in the long run? Do I think that those tax cuts can be sustainable? And by the way, I'm going to point out that we didn't really even get a tax cut. But hold that thought for right now. Let me just say something additionally on spending. It's not just the fact that government is spending too much money today. Just like in Europe, the United States has an aging population. Just like in Europe, we have falling birth rates. And when you have what are called tax and transfer entitlement schemes, social insurance programs, redistribution programs, well, you know, a lot of you probably learned in school, at least in the United States, we have something called the population pyramid we learn about. It shows the age distribution of the population. And historically, in, all, you know, in the United States and Austria, that population pyramid had a few old people at the top, then a big generation of workers, and an even bigger generation of children under that. And when you had that population pyramid, a modest-sized welfare state was feasible. Because what are welfare states? They're largely redistribution from workers to retirees. And when you have just a few old people and lots of workers, you can mathematically have a modest-sized welfare state. But what's happening? We're living longer. So at the top of the pyramid, it's going like that. And we're also having fewer children. So the bottom of the pyramid is going like that. Population pyramids are becoming what's called population cylinders. And the welfare state becomes mathematically very, very challenging in that environment. And what it means is in Austria, in the United States, and other countries around the world, the burden of government spending is automatically going to increase because there will be fewer taxpayers generating GDP and more and more government spending obligations because of the promises that have been made through all these social insurance and entitlement programs. So government already is too big in the, U in the U.S. It's already too big, of course, in Austria. It's even bigger than it is in the U.S. And guess what? We're all facing a more difficult future, probably with a lot more taxes, unless we figure out some way to reform these entitlement programs. And Donald Trump said during the campaign that he doesn't want to touch the entitlement programs. Now, he said that, but he did try to repeal Obamacare. Uh, you know, so so, so he, he, he's not a lost cause. The budget people that he has working for them are good people. Many of them I've known for decades. And they're trying to steer Trump in the right direction. I mean, again, Think you, you pull a random man off the street and you're trying to educate him and, uh, and convince him to do the right thing on government policy. That's what the staffers who are working for the White House and the different executive branch agencies are trying to do. Uh, so that's the long run problem of spending and how can you have good tax policy when you have bad spending policy. Keep that in the back of your mind. So now let's consider before we talk about the specifics of the Trump tax plan, what is it that we want to do on tax policy? And what are the principles of good tax policy? Well, they're pretty basic. You want low marginal tax rates. Because what are tax rates? Tax rates are the price you impose upon something. Now, politicians understand this when they want to. Politicians all the time uh, and, and, and you know, here in Austria, in Brussels, in Washington, D.C., and, and capitals all around the nation, all around the world, politicians bang their fists on the table and say, we need higher taxes on tobacco because 
we want people to smoke less. And from an economic perspective, they're right. The higher the tax you put on something, less, the less you get of it. Now, I'm a libertarian. I don't think it's government's job to control our private lives, but their, their microeconomic analysis is correct. But here's what gets me upset. If they understand that higher taxes on tobacco will lead to, will lead to less smoking, why don't they understand that higher marginal tax rates on work will lead to less employment, less entrepreneurship? Uh, the, the principles are exactly the same, and they operate exactly the same. So, you want marginal tax rates on productive behavior to be low because we want more productive behavior. You also want to make sure there's no tax bias against saving and investing. Now, I don't know the details of the Austrian tax system, but I can tell you some horrifying things about the U.S. tax system. If you earn money in the United States, you then pay tax on it. What do you then have? You then have after-tax income. What are the two things you can do with your after-tax income? You can either consume it right away, or you can save and invest so that you can consume it in the future. Now, in theory, with a good tax system, you don't want the government to distort that decision between current consumption and future consumption. <clears throat> However, between the capital gains tax, the corporate income tax, the double tax on dividends, and the death tax, you could have as many as four layers of tax if you save and invest your after-tax income. Whereas if you immediately consume your after-tax income, in the U.S. there's no additional tax liability. Now, you don't have to be a wild-eyed supply sider, you don't have to be art lapper, you don't have to be, you, you don't have to have, you know, you can have the most conventional, boring views in the world on tax policy, and think about it. If you tax four times for saving and investing, and zero times for consuming, what are people going to do? They're going to save and invest less. Now, what makes this especially foolish is every single theory of economics, even Marxism, even socialism, all theories of economics agree that capital formation, i.e. saving and investing, is critical for long-run growth and higher living standards. You have to set aside some of today's income to finance tomorrow's growth. It's that simple. And yet, in the United States, and I suspect to a good degree in Austria, politicians <laughs> put much heavier levels of tax on saving and investing than they do on consuming. Why? Because rich people do a lot of saving and investing. And politicians love to tax rich people because then you can pay 90% of the people uh, against 10% of the people. And you wind up with very destructive tax systems. And the final principle of good tax policy, you don't want distortionary preferences. You don't want special loopholes that bribe people into making economically foolish decisions. Uh, now, there are other goals as well. Uh, I want a lower overall tax burden. But as we just talked about, in the long run, if you want that, you better make sure to control government spending. It would also be nice to have a very simple system. In the United States, our tax code is 76,000 pages long. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how many Bibles it would take to get to 76,000 pages, uh, but it's a, it, you know, unlike the Bible, there are nothing but bad things in the tax code. Um, so, so these are the principles of good tax policy. Now let's look at what Trump talked about during the campaign and what he eventually decided to do once he became president. When he first was running for president, he proposed a giant tax cut. And when I say giant, I mean, I love big tax cuts. Uh, you know, Federico, he probably fantasizes about Victoria's Secret models. I fantasize about giant tax cuts. So, so hey, you know, Trump had, I mean, by some measures, $12 trillion tax cut over 10 years. But here's the problem. I knew it wasn't serious. Because there's no way uh, that you can do a $12 trillion tax cut when you're not planning on controlling government spending. So he had this grandiose plan. Then, miraculously, he got elected, which nobody expected. By the way, Election day in 2016, I was in London, and I gave a speech that day. And I told the audience, 
you don't need to stay up late because there's no way Trump is going to win. And fortunately, it wasn't until like 5 in the morning London time that it looked like Trump was going to win and nobody was still around, so I didn't look like that much of a fool. <laughs> or I probably looked like a fool, but no one was there to say, hey, wait, just a few hours ago you told us this couldn't happen. Uh, so Trump got elected, then all of a sudden, the sort of meaningless things he said during the election were suddenly serious. And so you have this man on the street who has these sort of vague ideas about tax cuts, propose this giant pie-in-the-sky Santa Claus tax plan, uh, but no way to make the numbers work. So all of a sudden, he had to sort of pare down and reduce his tax cut. So after the election, he came out with another tax plan. Smaller, but still completely unrealistic. Once he then got inaugurated, because he got elected in November, he became president on January 20th of 2017. Well, then his administration was responsible for, okay, you guys have to finally get serious. What are you really going to do? And so they put forward a set of talking points. And, and, and Trump's opponents, uh, his enemies in Washington said, this is a joke. You, 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 you're supposed to come out with a very detailed plan. You're supposed to have all sorts of uh, you know, numbers, and you're, you know, you're supposed to show how everything works together. And all Trump had is, well, I want to lower this, I want to lower this, I want to change this. And then people got very frustrated. However, that set of talking points turned out to be very, very helpful. Because what it did is it told people these are the main things, it told Congress, to be more specific, it told Congress, these are the main things I want to do. That's what Trump was saying. Reduce the corporate tax rate. Originally, Trump was saying from 35% to 15%, and he gave the right reasons for it. He didn't say he wanted to reduce the corporate tax rate uh, because he liked rich people. He said he wanted to lower the corporate tax rate because it would be good for American competitiveness and it would be good for job creation. And you know, there were a few other bullet points too, but, but everyone understood this is what the tax plan would have to be organized around. This had a vision that was going to be in the tax plan. Now here's the challenge. And remember, we do not have a parliamentary system. The members of Congress might be of the same party, but they are elected independently of the president. And they are politically independent. I mean, there's obviously pressure, there's, there's peer pressure, there's philosophical pressure uh, to sort of be on the same page uh, when it comes to public policy. But there's no guarantee that Republican members had to vote for Trump. And every time Trump said something stupid, Every time he sent out a controversial tweet, uh, it, it gave Republicans on Capitol Hill an excuse to maybe vote no. And so for those of us who follow this issue closely and work with the members on Capitol Hill to try to educate them on issues, we were looking at these rules. The rules on Capitol Hill, and in the House, there are no rules. Well, there is a rule, the Rules Committee decides what it wants. So. The, the House of Representatives is like a dictatorship. Whatever the Rules Committee and 218 votes say, that happens. In the Senate, though, in order to cut taxes, a permanent tax cut, you need 60 votes if you're reducing revenues after the 10-year period. There were 52, and then 51. Some of you probably read about that Alabama Senate election where we had this child molester running as a Republican. Uh, you know, it, it was a very strange political year in America, uh, I'll just say that. <laughs> but yeah, Republicans had a very narrow majority in the U.S. Senate. They certainly did not have 60 votes for a permanent tax cut. So the question was, Donald Trump's giant tax plan, which became a medium-sized giant tax plan, and then it eventually became just a set of talking points, how could that be turned into a revenue neutral tax bill that could get through this, this political process where Republicans only had 51 votes uh, and they couldn't have a permanent tax cut. That was a major challenge. However, it happened. And, and by the way, I already confessed 
that my prediction about Trump winning was way wrong? Well, I was wrong about the tax cut, too. I thought there was no way it was going to happen. I thought there was no way it was going to happen because a lot of Republicans were going to... You know, I mentioned at the start of my speech they don't like Trump. Well, I thought some of them would just use the excuse of not liking Trump to vote against the tax cut. And, and Trump, by the way, with his Twitter account, he insults members. And so, so if, you're a, if, if you're a U.S. senator and you're used to people treating you like God, yeah, everybody who comes to you treats you like a god because you can give them money through the political system. And all of a sudden you have this president of your own political party who's insulting you. <laughs> giving you nicknames. Uh, you know, I, 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 it is such a strange world in Washington now, so completely different, as I said, than we've ever experienced. And so I thought, well, uh, there's no way when Republicans can't lose more than, because the Democrats were going to be unanimously against whatever Trump did because they hate him with the passion and the fire of a thousand sons. So, so Republicans, especially once they lost an Alabama Senate race, they could only lose two senators. And there are, there are, there are more than a few Republican senators who are big government oriented. They're not libertarians, they're not conservatives, they're not in favor of small government. So I thought, well, a lot of these Republican senators probably don't like tax cuts anyhow, and they hate Trump, and Trump's insulting them. So I thought, no, there's no way it can happen, especially because under those rules that we just looked at in the previous slide, those rules made it so that you couldn't make the plan a permanent tax cut. Now, why does this matter? Because if you're a politician, you like to play Santa Claus. You like to give people government spending, because then they vote for you, and you like to give them tax cuts. That matter of fact, that's the definition of a populist. A populist gives away money with both hands. He gives tax cuts and he gives spending increases. Now, of course, in the long run, that doesn't work very well, but that's the way most politicians, that's the instinct of most politicians. They always like to make people happy, because if you make people happy, they're going to vote for you. So think about this now. In order to get a tax cut through, it has to be revenue neutral in year 11, 12, you know, in other words, the long run impact has to be revenue neutral. And what does that mean? It means for every dollar you cut taxes, you have to raise taxes a dollar someplace else. Well, all of a sudden, you're not being Santa Claus. You're being the Grinch. You have the Grinch here, you know what the Grinch means, right? Okay. So, so, you know, okay, I'm going to give you a dollar tax cuts, but I'm going to raise your taxes a dollar. Well, all of a sudden, you're going to be angry. You might not even trust me anyhow. You'll definitely be worried, so you'll be calling up and writing letters, and you'll be thinking, well, okay, maybe he'll give me a tax cut. So, so Republicans wound up having to put together a bill that had revenue increases. Now, I'm showing up on the screen. What were, the, the, the big thing, as I already said, was the corporate tax cut. And eventually, they, it came down to 21%. Not 15, but you know, 21% was much better than I thought was possible. And it had a few other tax cuts in it as well. But here's the part that should have been controversial. Actually, it was controversial. But this is the part that I thought would kill the bill. Trump substantially restricted the deductibility of state and local taxes. He modified the definition of inflation because, of course, our tax brackets are indexed to inflation. So we used a measure of inflation that's lower, uh, which means the tax brackets don't adjust as fast which means over time that creates a wedge effect with more revenue going to government. We curtail the deductibility of business interest. I thought all those things were going to get the affected interest groups so upset that they would find two Republican senators to vote no. But they didn't. This was really amazing. Now, probably the most important part of the tax increases was this restricting the deductibility of state and local taxes. The way this works in the United States, if you live in a high tax state like New York or California, New York is like the France of America, California is like the Italy of America. Uh, they don't work very well. If they work very well, I'd say they were the Sweden or Denmark of America, but they don't work very well, so they're the France and Italy of America. But if, if the politicians in New York or California raise your taxes, you don't like that, but you know what? Under the old rules, you could deduct that money you paid to the state politicians, 
you could deduct it from your federal tax return, your central government tax return. So if the politicians on your state level taxed you $100, if you were in the top tax bracket, it only cost you $60. Now, you didn't like the $60, but the $100 you paid to the state enabled you to reduce your central government tax bill by $40. So, so, in effect, subsidized high taxes at the state and local level. Well, getting rid of this, well, we didn't totally get rid of it, but capping this deduction at $10,000 is very bad news for rich people in California, in New Jersey, in New York, in places like that. Now, what I didn't realize at the time, but I should have, is guess how many Republican senators are from New York? Zero. Two. Guess how many Republican senators are from California? Zero. How many Republican senators from Illinois? Zero. From New Jersey? Zero. From Connecticut? Zero. All the left-wing states with the very high state and local taxes, in the Senate, they have nothing but Democratic senators. And the Democratic senators were going to vote no anyhow. So, the Republicans in the Senate, even the ones who aren't very free market oriented, they sat there and thought, like you know, uh, Susan Collins from Maine, uh, Lisa Murkowski from Alaska. You know, these are politicians who normally vote with the Democrats for bigger and bigger government. But they were looking at this tax cut bill. Well, let's say a bunch of people in New York and California are going to pay higher taxes, and the businesses in my state get lower taxes. Sounds like a good deal to me. And so, so Republicans wound up getting enough votes to get this legislation through the process. Now, I mentioned it's not a long-run tax cut. The orange line is the projection of what's going to happen to government spending over the next 10 years. The blue line is what revenues were supposed to be before the tax cut was passed and I guess, what is that, like a silver or gray line? That's what revenues are going to be under the tax cut plan. So you can see that in the short run, there's a tax cut. But by the time you get to the 10th year, the tax cut goes away. And if we had the numbers for the next 10 years, you would see that the, the gray or silver line is actually above the blue line. Not by much, but by a little bit. So there's no, first of all, it's not a big tax cut. Over the next 10 years, the central government is projected to collect about $44 trillion in taxes before the tax cut, and now they're going to collect about $42.8 trillion. Still a lot of money going to the politicians in Washington. So we've marginally reduced taxes in the short run, no long run tax cut, and yet you had politicians in Washington, the left wing politicians say, oh, this is the end of the world, the government's going to be starved of revenue. No, revenues go up every single year, far too fast. So what's the impact of this going to be? Let me go ahead and wrap up so we can get to the Q&A. It's always more interesting than me talking. Already, we're seeing very positive results. Certainly in political terms, but also, I think, in economic terms. Because companies keep announcing, you know, it seems like every other day, a new company is announcing that they're boosting pay and giving bonuses to their workers. The stock market is hitting new records. Companies are making big announcements of new investments they're going to be making. I mean, there have been announcements of companies bringing factories back from Mexico. They're bringing factories back from Canada. Uh, and every time, an announcement gets made, of course it's in the news. Uh, and so, right now, even though Republicans are terrified that the midterm elections in 2018 will be bad because of Trump's controversial nature, in the short run right now, there's lots and lots of good news. But as I say, short run is short run. Short run might not last till November, it might not last three years, it might not last five years. And you know, this ties into what I said earlier about government spending projected to grow faster and faster over time. That is the number one fiscal policy threat to the United States. And I'll make one final comment, and Federico sort of hinted at this already. We're gonna see a virtuous cycle of tax competition. Much as we saw after Reagan and Thatcher cut personal tax rates 40 years ago, 
we're going to see the same thing happening uh, with corporate taxes. Now, it's actually already been happening, uh, you know, because if you go back to 1980, the top corporate tax rate in OECD nations averaged 48%. And before the U.S. tax cut, it averaged 23 to 24%. And now that the U.S. has lowered its rate by 14 percentage points, I think we're going to see other countries cutting corporate taxes as well. Uh, so that's going to be very, very good news for the world economy. Now, there are some things we don't know. The U.S. moved, in general, to a territorial tax system. And we did other changes that sort of disrupt the OECD's BEPS initiative. The OECD, the, the evil international bureaucracy based in Paris that's always trying to harmonize taxes and stamp out tax competition. Well, they have an initiative to extract more money from the business community called the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Scheme. And that was designed to try to basically do what the common consolidated corporate tax base, you know, the, the politicians in Brussels have been trying to get that for a while. Well, the OECD is trying to get it as well. Basically, politicians, you know, whenever they get together, they try to figure out how can we harmonize our taxes to screw over taxpayers and give ourselves more money so we can buy more votes. Well, the U.S. tax plan is probably going to be destabilizing to the BEPS initiative. Not totally, because if you look at the details of the Republican tax plan, they have their own base erosion and profit shifting uh, initiatives in the bill. So in other words, they said, okay, business community, we're going to give you territoriality, but we're going to sort of reach into your back pocket and take some money out of your wallet at the same time. So it's unclear how that's going to settle out. Uh, it's probably going to be bad for the OECD, which is good because the OECD is such a bad bureaucracy, uh, but it's not going to be as good as some people think. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll go ahead and stop and uh, be happy to answer questions until uh, uh, people either get bored to death or Federico tells me it's time to shut up. So with that, thank you very much.